Sonic. Dr. Tara Bynum is an assistant professor of African American literature and culture. She received a BA, AB from Barnard College and, and an MA and PhD degrees in English from John Hopkins University. She teaches African American literature courses that seek after the many ways that people experience blackness as a racial identity and as a cultural category or as a mark upon the skin. At a time when social media responds to the deaths of unarmed black men and women with hashtag black, black Lives Matter, her courses question, what makes life matter? What literature is and what race or culture means historically and at present? These questions find their way into her book project, Reading Pleasures, which examines the ways in which 18th century enslaved and or free men and women feel good or experience pleasure in spite of the pri privations of slavery, unfreedom, or white supremacy. Her research and writing have received generous financial support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Amer American Antiquarian Society, Library Company of Philadelphia, Rutgers University, University of Pennsylvania's McNeil Center for Early American Studies, and the College of Charleston. Her essays have appeared in Commonplace, Legacy, J19, Criticism, and American Periodicals. You ready? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just kidding myself. Bakarathi Mani is Associate Professor in the Department of English Literature in Swath at Swarthmore College. Mani received her PhD in Modern Thought and Literature from Stanford University, her MA in Modern Indian History from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and her BSFS in Non-Western History and Diplomacy from Georgetown University. She is the author of Aspiring to Home, South Asians in America. Her essays have been published in American Quarterly, Social Text, The Journey of Asian American Studies, Diaspora, and Positions. Her current book project, Haunting Visions, South Asian Diasporic Visual and Exhibition Cultures, considers how images of empire have become archetypes of self-representation and diaspora. She recently curated Ruins and Fabrication, an exhibition of contemporary photography featuring the artists Anna Palakunathu, Matthew, and Gwari Gill of 12 Gates Gallery, Philadelphia, at 12 Gates Gallery. Kelly Moore is assistant professor at NYU in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication, where she examines the role of media technology in the production of legal and political knowledge. She is at work on a monograph about courtroom mediation that examines the role of the image in facilitating the performance of witness testimony in domestic violence cases. She earned her PhD in communication at the University of California, San Diego, and Kelly is a former University of California President's Postdoctoral Federal Fellow in her rhetoric at Berkeley. Her work can be found in Angelistica, Reviews in Cultural Theory and Feminist Surveillance Studies. Jyoti Priori is Professor of Sociology at Simmons College. She writes and teaches at the Crossroads of Sociology, Sexuality, and Queer Studies and Postcolonial Feminist Theory. Her books include Women, Body, Desire, and Postcolonial in India and Encountering Nationalism. She has also co-edited special, co special issues of journals and published numerous articles and book chapters. Her new book, Sexual States, Governance and the Struggle Against Antisodomy anti anti Law in India's Present, is forthcoming with Duke University Press. She is the recipient of fellowships and grants, including a Rockefeller Research Fellowship and a Fulbright Senior Research Award. She served as chair of the section of, on sex and gender for the American Sociological Association and is currently a co-editor for the journal for Cult Studies. Please welcome the panel of scholars for this last session. So good afternoon. Could you all do me a favor? If you have a pen, do you mind holding on to it if you are not holding on to it? And I would love to have you imagine for a moment that it's 1766, your pen is not full of ink, but instead is a quill pen, and you're an enslaved man named Caesar Linden. In front of you is an account book. Um, and you're in Newport, Rhode Island. I'd like for you to take a moment to imagine the scene. I'll fill in the, fill in the blanks momentarily, but for the time being, just, just imagine yourself, 1766, your name's Caesar Linden, you really like leather britches, and silver buckles, 
and there's an account book in front of you. You're also 30 something, just to give you a sense of age. Caesar Linden's sundry account book is a collection of lists. They're long lists and short lists, lists of numbers, persons, and events from 1761 to 1771 in an account book that is perfectly sized for list making. Neither too large nor too small, it is well made for the fancy cursive script that Linden uses to itemize marriages, deaths, and the sale and acquisition of goods and services. He notes to whom he sells, and in the way of double entry bookkeeping, he separates the debits and the credits. He records debits in the left column and credits are on the right. Linden's account holders are notable slave traders, enslaved servants, and free persons in and around Newport who have come to him for various reasons, including copying and food. He sells a lot of root celery, beets, sow pigs, and ketchup. <laughs> if anyone knows what 18th century ketchup is, please let me know. What may, not, what may at first glance look customary in early American, early American account books are fairly common is not. What is not common is its author, Caesar Linden. Linden is, as I've already told you, an enslaved man born on an uncertain day and in an unknown location. His master is a colonial clerk and one-term governor, Josias Linden of Newport, Rhode Island. Linden is a servant who not only possesses the requisite literacy and penmanship ability to write a list, his handwriting is so good, in fact, that Captain Caleb Godfrey pays him to copy a lengthy letter. He has numeracy too. Linden is a mathematician, a salesman, and a records keeper. He knows how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers, and in particular currency, namely those pounds, shillings, and pence of Rhode Island, but also New York and elsewhere. And just a word on pounds, shilling, and pence. If ever you try to add up pounds, shillings, and pence from the 18th century, know that you'll run into a problem. So the fact that he can do this, at least by my estimation, is actual genius, because I couldn't figure it out. Um, How's it the Rhode Island Historical Society? Linden's well-kept account book may be the only extant of its kind, namely an 18th century enslaved man's memoranda book. Its genre and Linden's, Linden's bookkeeping skills are noteworthy and compelling. This book isn't simply a diary or a narrative telling of his life. Rather, Linden's book invites a consideration of the account book and its list as genres of storytelling. And it is impossible to ignore his numbers. Numbers litter his dated notations. He creates pricing and numerical value for the slaughter and sale of pigs, beets, and textiles, as well as those items exchanged or received. As items are purchased, he makes note of what he receives in return for his merchandise. Sometimes it's cash. Sometimes it's black stockings. Sometimes it's pickles and pickled lobster. Anyone had pickled lobster? Sounds disgusting. <laughs> a linen handkerchief or silk. And when money is owed to him, Lyndon writes letters to request those balances due. Part ledger and part journal, what he collects in numbers and lists on bound and loose paper are stories of Newport's enslaved, free, and local slave traders just a few years before the Revolutionary War. Take, for example, Lyndon's note of Captain Robert Elliott's safe arrival to Newport from Jamaica by way of Philadelphia in the early morning on September 20th, 1768, or the mention of Boston Vose's return from Suriname, August 9th, 1768, with six china cups, six saucers, and a looking glass yellow around the frame for Lyndon. Lyndon assesses the value of his friend's items as if they were acquired to be sold by him at a later date. On September 13, 1769, there's a description of Gover Governor Linden's accidental fall from his house and his resulting collarbone, broken collarbone. Linden laments to the death of his two-year-old darling son, Pompey, who dies of the bloody flux on a Wednesday morning in September of 1765. Even though the announcement of his baby boy's death is simple and brief, Linden says just enough to witness his grief. Lyndon gathers these stories that leave us to wonder about what their plot or wonder about their plot or even their end result. Admittedly, what he does not say prompts a curiosity that troubles 
the expectations of this early American literary form. What strikes me as I read his list is that, he, that his accounting and his list making refuse the limits of a presentist African American literary tradition. Firstly, Lyndon's account book is easy, is easy to find in the guide to manuscripts at the Rhode Island Historical Society relating to people of color. Even though it rarely, if ever, makes it into anthologies or literary criticism, it is neither lost nor recovered. Despite its accessibility, at first glance, it might be easy to miss what's exciting about Lyndon's list amidst, amidst the rows of names and sow pigs. Because, there, because there's an expectation that African-American literature must take up resistance or enact agency, one man's list of debits and credits might seem a bit underwhelming or disappointing. It's so often that what we look for in the archive is proof that someone wanted to, in the proverbial words of a favorite 2017 film, Get Out. But this is, a, this is a present day misunderstanding or misguided expectation rather than Lyndon's problem. Instead of resistance or direct action, Lyndon's lists mark everyday living for which we must learn to read that hints at a complicity in the very daily business of slavery. And this complicity is worthy of the sorts of scholarly curiosity that are not simply anchored in disappointment or loss. Lyndon's transactional and quotidian notations require a new re way of reading of what is there in the archive or in the special collections library at the Historical Society. In this instance, what is there demands an understanding of 18th century accounting practices, a rethinking of account books as a literary genre, and a willingness to engage with mundanity. Secondly, Lyndon's list disrupts the origin stories of African-American literature that begin with either poetry or a narrative of godly salvation. Lyndon precedes Phyllis Wheatley's fame or even her first published poem, and what he recounts is not a slave narrative or a conversion narrative as might be expected. There is no escape, no sordid plot twist or well-articulated freedom dream. Lyndon's lists are not concerned with proving his humanity or pursuing freedom. Despite what he doesn't say about freedom or even his enslavement, his lists serve him well, even though his chosen form tends to haunt and vex early African-American literary history. Lists in the form of census data, farm books, records of unnamed bodies, tend to inventory dehumanization. 18th century lists remind, often remind us what is not said and what we cannot know, a withheld last name, an uncertain birth date, and the certainty of enslavement. These lists name their lack, their, refu their refusal to specify and seemingly prove that with every entry their resulting archive is, in fact, as Saidiya Harmon suggests, a tomb. For Lyndon, his list of dates, events, and numbers chronicle 10 years worth of decidedly ordinary transactions. And it's Lyndon's ordinariness that makes his account book such an extraordinary, well-cataloged find Lyndon sells everything from rum to silver buckles. He's a one-stop shop for Newport's merchant and seafaring class. He names Newport's most prominent families, Wanton, Champlin, Lopez, Sisson, <laughs> or Sisson, <laughs> as account holders. There's the sale of 150 root celery to Aaron Lopez, Newport's prominent Jewish slave trader, on October 29th, 1766. The celery costs Lyndon 22 pounds, 10 shilling. To the wealthy Anglican slave trade merchant, Christopher Champlin, Lyndon sells one, one and a half bushels of beets for six pounds. His transactions are extensive and evidence the extent to which Lyndon participates in the emerging, in cap, in the emerging capitalist and slave, slaving economy that makes Newport rich and cosmopolitan. Lyndon reaps the benefits of the ever-present ships, captains, and traders that return to the city with an ample harvest of goods from the slave economy. Though it was never meant to be printed, Lyndon's account book glimpses the life of a man whose lists situate him and his literate and numerate reader in a great community of traders, free and enslaved artisans and servants. His customers return often enough to partake of his goods, and with every return, he itemizes their debits, their remaining balances, and of course, the trinkets, textiles, or pigs that are credited to their account. 
What Lyndon leaves behind in about 32 handwritten pages is a catalog of lists that invites us to wonder just who Caesar Lyndon is and what he has to teach us about early American accounting and living. You should know that Lyndon has friends, and he says so. He courts a wife, and together they must grieve the loss of a baby only 28 months and eight days old. He goes to weddings and funerals. He counts money and delights in fine china, cups and saucers, and of course, leather britches. I promise you, between the pigs and the leather britches, it's amazing how much pork and leather Caesar must consume. <laughs> Amidst, the collect amidst his collectibles and with friends, I find him for the first time because of a list on a summer day in 1766, and that is what you see right here. It's Tuesday, August 12th, 1766, and Caesar Linden is having a pig roast. It's just a week after the solar, solar eclipse that has Newport a buzz, even amidst the city's calls to repeal the Stamp Act of 1765. His menu is simple and thorough and itemized a pig to roast, wine, bread, rum for drink and killing the pig, butter, sugar, tea, and coffee, limes for punch, and green corn. Even though the Rhode Island General Assembly might take issue with his beverage selection or even the number of enslaved persons that far from their respective homes, Lyndon spends quite a bit of pounds, shillings, and pence too to host this gathering, not only for his menu but also the necessary lodging. The pig to roast is valued at eight pounds, 10 shillings. The room to rent is seven pounds, four shillings. Wine costs him three pounds and 12 shillings. Linden must, rum to drink and rum to kill the pig is valued at two pounds, 10 shillings and 10 shillings respectively. Linden must know that the rum sweetens the meat and of course subdues the pig. Linden carefully records a line item for each expense and totals his cost at 33 pounds, 13 shillings, and his math is correct. If you try to add that up the way you know how to add, though, it's gonna be wrong. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> That's the plot twist of pounds, shillings, and pence I learned. Just above his list of purchases is another list, namely his guests. His list of attendees is not long enough, though, just a small group of friends, Boston Vose, Zingo Stevens, Phyllis Linden, Neptune Sisson, or Sisson, <laughs> and his wife, Prince Thurston, and his wife, and of course, Linden and Sarah Searing. Linden doesn't bother to explain what they have in common or what makes them friends. They are not all the same age, but what is age to someone who may not know his or her birthday? Mm -hmm. The records would suggest that Phyllis is about 20 years old, Sarah and Neptune are older in their mid-30s. Zingo's age is unknown, but he does die 51 years later in 1817, which would suggest that on this day, in 1766, he's young enough to live another half century and old enough to love on Phyllis and to roast a pig with his 30-something-year-old friends. <laughs> Zingo will outlive Phyllis, Caesar Linden, and Sisson. Stevens will, Stevens will live longer than his and Phyllis's two-month-old son, Prince, who dies two weeks after his mother in 1773. Sarah Searing will die at 94 in 1826. Her February 9th, 1826 obituary remembers her as a venerable and highly respected woman of color who had a long and respectable life. I've not yet found a way to date Prince Thurston or his wife with no name. Even though their ages are not certain, what they, what they know and do share are their relationships to another and a desire to roast a pig on a Tuesday in Portsmouth. Together these men and women are friends and for, and for a time lovers. See, this is a couple's trip, but for Boston Vose, whose name appears without an and next to it. Maybe Vose, often at sea, has a friend or love interest to meet in Portsmouth. Lyndon and Searing are not yet married, but they've already lost their son. They will be married lawfully in over a year in 1767 by Ezra Stiles, pastor of Newport's Second Congregational Church and later president of Yale. In the weeks before their marriage, Lyndon remembers that he whitewashed Sarah's bedchamber and painted the woodwork blue. Searing and Lyndon are married just months after Zingo Stevens and Phyllis. Lyndon cites their union Sunday about two o'clock, July 20th, 1767, Mr. Zingo Stevens and Miss Phyllis Linden, married by the Reverend Edward Upham, pastor of First Baptist Church. 
Neptune and Prince Thurston are already married. Sisson, Neptune Sisson's unnamed wife might be Dinah, who, as his widow, writes in late 1794 to the Free African Union Society about her husband's membership dues. They get into a whole fight. Mm -hmm. It's a whole big thing. Lyndon doesn't say much else about what happens on the 12th of August, 1766, or the night before, and certainly not the day after. No travel arrangements, and even though Portsmouth is a few miles north of Newport by land or river, Lyndon makes no line item for, how, for the how of their travel, a seemingly important consideration because there's a pig to transport and nine persons. There's no specific detail. Instead, Lyndon just leaves us to wonder about so much. Admittedly, I still have so many questions about Caesar Linden, about what happens on this day, but I certainly, I'm certainly all the more kind of curious about how to, how to frame his account book, how to make sense of his account book, and ultimately what we should do with his account book in a way that has us rethink what we imagine 18th century African American literature to be or to not be. Thank you. Faki Athimani. Thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out with us. And Kimberly, I just want to extend a deep gratitude to you for inviting me to be um, to be a part of this. It's my first time at the dark room, and I have been so enriched by all of your collective work and conversation. So thank you so much. I really cherish that. Um, and also thank you to Vanessa for <laughs> keeping us on time um, all day. And I will try and zip through my presentation. OK. Um, in my book in progress, Haunting Vision, South Asian Diasporic Visual and Exhibition Cultures, I've been writing about the work of South Asian diasporic artists who deploy 19th century and early 20th century photography. Images from family albums, newspapers, government portraits, and landscape surveys to create representations of South Asian America. For racialized diasporic viewers, these images <coughs> illustrate the fact of empire in all its expansive and terrifying scale. Artifacts of the past, they record another time, another place, documenting the history of a colonized nation far removed from our own. But taken out of the colonial archive that we see as a pr proper home, these same photographs begin to disorient us. The photographs acquire an uncanny familiarity, as if an element of the image, a body, a building, shrubs in the landscape, a look in someone's eye, is something that we already know. We look and look again at these images, and in that constant looking, we begin to see the photograph as an object that we have already seen before. In our repeated viewings, we acquire a closeness to the image that quite suddenly and unexpectedly shows our proximity to the colonial archive. The object that we're looking at, the visual record of colonial rule in South Asia, slips, turns, and records instead the empire that we live in now the terrifying and expansive sweep of imperial power that marks us as racialized subjects in the United States. I call this mode of seeing an uncanny vision, a practice of seeing and identifying with South Asian American art that produces the effect of being haunted by empire. The desire to see oneself in the image, I argue, expands the temporal scope of empire, such that empire is not a place in another time, but a feeling that saturates our everyday experience as diasporic subjects. I'm going to turn to the artist Sahir Shah's drawing, Geometric Landscapes and the Spectacle of Force. Here, Shah creates a built landscape that haunts the viewer. Skyscrapers, pillars adorned with winged creatures, obelisks and minarets proliferate across the surface of the drawing. Alongside this imaginative landscape, Shah reproduces archival photography of colonial monuments, canopies, amphitheaters, and parade grounds built in Delhi in the early 20th century to commemorate the coronation of the British king and queen as emperor and empress of India. These are the events called the Delhi Darbars. They took place in 1877, 1903, and 1911. And I'll just show you very quickly. These are the, these are the canopies and the amphitheaters that I am referring to. And these are the monuments, these skyscrapers. This is what Shah has drawn. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, that Shah could not access the archival photographic images of the Darbars at the National Archives in India. She is an American citizen, but of Pakistani origin, and so she was uh, refused access to the National Archives in India. She had to travel to England for research. Mm. 
So these architectural structures, that is uh, architectural structures of the Darbar, appear as reverse negative prints, they're white on black, and they're immediately doubled. Replicated right side up and upside down, the monuments become mirror images within the print. Creating a strong horizontal line, more photographs emerge. Silhouetted images of cavalrymen holding flags, troops standing at attention, a turban soldier floating on the lower foreground of the drawing. In the background, geometric patterns expand and contract in great waves. Spilling across the sightline of the canvas and photographs that are reproduced not once or twice, but up to 10 times, geometric landscapes produces a spectacle of imperial violence that, I argue, ties together colonial India with 21st century America. I first encountered Shah's artwork at Nature Mort Gallery in New Delhi at a solo exhibition titled From Paper to Monument. As a Pakistani artist raised in Brussels and in London, a longtime resident of Brooklyn who is now uh, living in New Delhi, this was Shah's first exhibition in India. It was also the gallery's first exhibition by a Pakistani. Trained as an architect at the Rhode Island School of Design, in the mid-2000s, Shah's drawings were frequently exhibited as an example of contemporary art that deploys, and I quote, signs and symbols from Islamic cultures, end quote, or in relation to her presumed identity as a, quote, Pakistani-American, American, South Asian, and Muslim, end quote, artist. These were the representations of identity that I expected to see in her works on paper. But as I viewed geometric landscapes, I was suddenly disoriented. Standing in close proximity to her drawing, I recognize the architectural emblems as photographs of one place, colonial South Asia, even as I stood in a gallery that was itself emblematic of another place, neoliberal India. In the photographs of troops carrying flags, I saw not only the expansive domain of the British Empire on the subcontinent, but, though this was not directly depicted, the steady invasion of US troops into Pakistan and Afghanistan in the 21st century. And in the skyscrapers that punctuated the drawing, I was reminded of still another place, my apartment where I then lived in New York City. Seeing this drawing displayed in an upscale Delhi neighborhood, I found myself in a place and time not removed from the drawing, but utterly immersed in it, as if the drawing reflected the empires that shape my life now. In his reading of Shah's drawings, the art historian Iftikhar Dadi emphasizes how Shah layers hand-drawn calligraphy and ornament on archival images to suggest a dreamscape of imbricated pasts of Muslim, British, and Sikh South Asia that persist in the present as a sequence of uncanny afterimages. Such dreamscapes are the imaginative worlds that bind together distinct national and religious histories, Mughal monuments, British parade grounds, Sikh soldiers, landscapes and figures that are iconic representations of the subcontinent's imperial past. But in describing the persistence of these representations as uncanny after images, Dadi also points to the ways in which the viewer is drawn to Shah's work as something familiar, and in its very familiarity, terrifying. Looking at Shah's drawings reminds us of something that we have seen before. Our disorientation in seeing these images is a measure of how close we are, indeed how we might already inhabit the physical, the physical and psychic spaces that are mapped within the drawing. Um, sorry, this was one of the archival images of the amphitheater that's duplicated in the drawing there. Okay. The uncanny is frequently read as a mark of the return of the repressed or as a feeling of dread in relation to human-like figures such as automatons or androids. By contrast, I define the uncanny as a sense of spatial disorientation and abjection in space that emerges out of the subject's failure to see. As Freud notes, the essential factor in the production of the feeling of uncanniness is ascribed to intellectual uncertainty, so that the uncanny would always be that in which one does not know where one is, as it were. The better orientated in his environment a person is, the less readily will he get the impression of something uncanny in regard to the objects and events in it. So I want to stress here the distinction that Freud makes between the uncanny as a measure of intellectual uncertainty and the uncanny as a disorientation in space. And he gives several examples in um, his 1919 essay, The Uncanny, that highlights how the uncanny links a problem of orientation, physical orientation, to the experience of abjection. Um, so he describes wandering around a dark, strange room looking for the door or for the electric switch and colliding repeatedly with the same piece of furniture. Um, and in contrast to the first example that's in this quote about uh, walking through a forest, this second example takes place within a dark room that renders a domestic space unfamiliar or strange. Um, and reading Freud's quote here really 
helps me to think about Sarah Ahmed's um, work on her orientations towards objects, what she describes as a queer phenomenology, uh, walking through dark rooms and bumping into objects there, leaving uh, and taking account of the bodily impressions that such collisions leave um, on us. In any case, in the forest and inside the dark room, the uncanny emerges in that moment of disorientation where the subject is unable to see or feel a pathway out of a defined space and becomes keenly aware of their orientation as foreign or other or as object within that space. So my viewings of geometric landscapes and the spectacle of forests produce precisely this uncanny effect. Stretching 10 feet across and nearly five feet in height, geometric landscapes create a panoramic vision. In my initial viewing, I was compelled by the reproductions of landscape photographs from the darbars, the gateways that are part of the massive amphitheater built for the 1903 darbar, the cupolas that denote the canopied structure occupied during the 1911 darbar, and the processionals of cavalrymen. Along with the silhouetted images of two differently turbaned men in the drawing, each of the photographs reproduced in Shah's work secured my initial impression of the drawing as a representation of quote unquote India. My identification of the drawing, the drawing is India, connects to my identification with the drawing. Because I know this drawing is India, it secures my identity as a South Asian. But as my eyes travel repeatedly across the same structures from left to right and back again, that representational narrative of the self in relation to the drawing becomes slippery. Across the drawing, the reproduction of the colonial monument is central to a visual narrative that refutes the authority of empire and disseminates its spatial and temporal effects. I want to think for a moment about what else we see in this drawing. Writing on the visual archive created by September 11, 2001, the curator Okwe and Wizor suggests that it is difficult to come to terms artistically with this moment, in part because the images of the crumbling towers and exploding planes were instantly and repetitively broadcast across the world, with the effect that, quote, the images became archival the instant the first footage surfaced and the need for documentary accounts grew. As N. Wizor goes on to note, and I quote, September 11th created a new economy, a vast economy of the iconic le linking archive to traumatic public memory. It is my memory of what Enzor calls the economy of September 11th that flares up when I see geometric landscapes in the spectacle of force now as a digital reproduction on my computer screen. Its diminished scale yields itself to a powerful experience of empire, one that mirrors my experience of watching the events of September 11th as a series of images broadcast on the television screen. Against the memory of those television events, I turn to the rectangular shapes of skyscrapers that lie across the center of the drawing, which bisect and interrupt the photographic reproductions. Two buildings mirror each other. One is black, the other is white, both marked with a small cross, the white one you can't see in this image. A third structure is white with no windows, bearing what looks like a lightning bolt on its roof. Formally and stylistically disjunct from the amphitheaters and canopies, which are the photographic reproductions, it is these hand-drawn objects that suture the experience of seeing empire with my experience of being subject to empire in the United States. What I see in these buildings mapped over and above the photographic reproductions are the image archives of September 11th, an archive that has been so thoroughly domesticated that it has come to serve as a shorthand for memory. So I want to draw your attention to a structure at the extreme left of the drawing, the last structure that you can see on the left-hand side. It's a flat rectangular surface covered with a striped flag. I think you can see some sort of um, vertical stripes there. Positioned in front of a pixelated tower that has two crescent-shaped gashes, a tower that I read as mirroring the implosion of two World Trade Center, this object is hard to find. I read the flat surface of the object as a cenotaph and the stripes that cover it as remnants of an American flag. If we scan the drawing from left to right, beginning with the cenotaph, the pageantry of the darbar that unfolds across the canvas cannot be read solely as a depiction of 19th century British colonialism on the subcontinent. Instead, I propose a line of vision that begins with the invasion of Afghanistan and Pakistan by US troops following September 11th, the use of one terrorist attack to initiate the terrifying expansion of US empire on the subcontinent in order, in order to alter the time scale of the drawing. Reading the cenotaph, the stripes, and the skyscrapers as an alternate architectural landscape of empire across two continents, my experience of the drawing narrates the ties that bind British imperial authority with US military occupation in South Asia. 
Outside of this drawing, there are no monuments to those civilian deaths caused by drone attacks, missiles, and combat in South Asia, just as there is no monument to the colonization and partition of the subcontinent outside of the archival photographs and drawings of a quote-unquote undivided colonial India, which is an India that is already a spectral memory for post-colonial Pakistani and Indian subjects. To see Shah's architectural forms in relation to my memories of a visual archive of September 11th, and to see both in relation to the photographic reproductions of the monuments that compose the Darbar, means that we must come to terms with the fact that photography records what Roland Barthes has called a catastrophe which has already occurred. Yet in my viewing, the drawing does not simply record a single past catastrophe, whether the terror of colonial rule on the subcontinent or the decimation of a terrorist attack in New York City. Instead, the catastrophe that emerges out of the drawing that exceeds every one of the iconic photographic forms that it archives is the ongoing catastrophe of the US as a global empire. The performance theorist Peggy Phelan contends that the destruction that took place on September 11th is a kind of repetition, a historical event that contains its own mirror. She writes, the, tw the Twin Towers are themselves copies, doubles, if you will, that became the stage for the attack of two planes, the second shadowing the first. The repetition within the event, um, a repetition expressed both architecturally and geographically, was itself copied by photographs that circled the world. Mapping this doubling quality of September 11th onto Shah's drawings brings into relief the uncanny vision of empire that we see. If the drawing reproduces the architecture of the British Empire via the photographic images of two darbars, it also reproduces the crumbling twin towers via the skyscrapers that Shah plots across the canvas. In this reading of geometric landscapes, such spectacles of force echo across the horizontal line of the drawing. I want to stress that it is not that the shape or form of US empire in the 21st century mimics the scale and scope of the British Empire in the 20th. Quite the contrary. It is the affective experience, the felt impact of viewing one archival photographic image in the shadow of the archive of another, um, another set of contemporary images, that makes us see these built structures, one real and the other imagined, as doubles of each other. As I read photographs of the Darbars alongside on the online archive documenting the collapse of the World Trade Center on September 11th, I'm acutely aware that I'm scrambling histories, insisting on a symmetry between real and imagined landscapes built a century apart. But if I insist on joining together these two image archives, even in a drawing that explicitly relies only on one such archive, it is to stress that when we encounter a new aesthetic object that quote unquote represents a history of race and empire, our way of seeing that object is already saturated with what we have seen before. It is my familiarity with the commercial architecture of capitalism in New York City that alerts me to the pageantry of empire in New Delhi. Or to put it another way, the darbars come alive to us because the photographic archive of 9-11 keeps another set of monuments resolutely alive, hmm. always crumbling, always on the brink of death. Writing on the uses of history by Asian American visual artist David N. contends, we do not bring the present into the past. Rather, we bring the past into the present. We keep the past alive in the present by signifying and quickening through our desire those creatures and things that conventional culture would disavow and bury. As racialized subjects, our desire to see our own histories means that when we encounter the visual work of diasporic artists, our modes of seeing are already saturated with the affective charge of multiple image archives. Rather than disavow or bury archival objects, Shah's drawing explicitly reproduces one collection of images, um, that of the Delhi Darbars of 1903 and 1911. What has quickened through my own desire to have this drawing make sense to me as a South Asian American subject is another archive fire, far removed from Shah's work, that is the online photographic and video archive of September 11th. If the past comes alive in the present, it does so precisely through the uncanny visions evoked by our diasporic viewing practices. Thank you. Kelly Moore. Kelly Moore. Okay. Uh, I, I changed the, I've changed my paper a little bit. Um, given what I've seen in the titles of the papers offered so far, I wanted to offer more of a piece that had to do uh, less with photography, which is what really grounds my work, and more with the sound, with, with, with the sonic. Uh, so my paper is to see, say, telecare in the sonic scene of complaint. Um, I've noticed that across the papers today, which were so beautiful, so wonderful, um, this question of, of lament, uh, and that, that word has occurred in a number of papers, uh, as well as um, uh, as well as uh, care. Okay, so 
Um, the etymology of care um, out of Old English, um, moving through Old High German, uh, through Old Norse, uh, means uh, grief and lament of a variety of ways of articulating that. Um, what I'm interested here in this etymology is the way in which uh, the word care um, comes out of grief, but then in, um, as it develops in the West, um, becomes um, a domestic location in the sick bed, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how care uh, ends up in a, in a domestic space and what that means for state uh, and, and militarily controlled institutions. Um, I'm also going to read together in this paper, I'm going to read against or collide uh, two uh, public forms of assembly. And I'm quite interested in what may happen uh, theoretically by doing so. And I would love in the question and answer period if you would say, uh, Kelly, this works, or Kelly, this doesn't work, and you lose something or something terrible happens um, through this collision. So. Um, telecare has reorganized the home. Its reach into patients' lives and family and community dynamics is seconded only to the domestic incorporation of the television set, cable, and video game consoles. Um, the ancient meaning of care included both anxious worry and a solicitude in caring for. The meaning concerns grief and a domestic location for the sounding of that grief. Recent scholarship attests to the difficulty theorizing the hybrid space of the university campus. My undergraduate students unanim unanimously understand their relationship to me and the university space through the metaphor of family, for example. Teachers and administrators in their residence hall are like parents. The university campus as a whole is a home. The campus community is a family. A split between home, professional, and the milieu of the feast crowd. The American university campus is a tempting, yet nevertheless incorrect, space to discover metaphors of family. There's actually something to be gained in the work together that we do because of the fact that I'm not their mother, the fact that they are not my children. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> um, OK. Um, so in, and I'm going to bring, like I said, two cases together. Um, in case one, uh, the college campus, both private and public, is a control environment where the provision of telecare services has expanded into the, into the design of sexual assault reporting devices. The accusation of sexual assault is increasingly mediated and managed via online publics. Mainstream media accounts of campus sexual assault increasingly unfold across electronic social media. These accounts include claims and chains of evidence in our era of evidence-based prosecution. Paying attention to the normal incidence of sexual assault in college campuses identifies another necropolitical geography in institutions of higher education, one that is oriented more and more um, to time rather than distance. Trauma takes time to unfold, as we've seen throughout uh, the papers today. One reason trauma is of interest as a form of communication from psychoanalysis um, to behavioralism is that self resists the recollection of traumatic experience. As a legally actionable category, um, trauma is something that must unfold over time. One must acknowledge that one has been raped, uh, for example, and then further decide to enter into an adversarial form or, or system of redress. Sexual assault technologies, uh, uh, assault technologies um, for recording assault are a unique example of the deployment of crowdsourcing logic to populations that are in the process of developing or claiming an identity position, that of a rape victim or rape survivor. Early constructivist accounts of telemedicine and telecare remarked how telemedical um, networks create health populations, what Lisa Cartwright calls remote locals that, that, quote, forge new concepts of community and identity through its identification of remote populations and expanded climate, client uh, catchment regions. In a short time, uh, these same biomedical actuarial marketing techniques have expanded into explicit crowdsourcing devices and strategies. As Tyler Reig uh, Reigeluth remarks, quote, insofar as technology, uh, sorry, insofar as virtually anything can be um, uh, can be discretized um, on and by electronic devices. Digital technology seem to involve an intensive and extensive materialization of our social interactions and experience through a dense technical networking of services, objects, institutions, and people." End quote. The university college campus has faced increasing scrutiny for its handling of sexual assault complaints. Right? Um, you can see this in the um, Dear Betsy campaign uh, that meant to really protest uh, to uh, and against Betsy DeVos and her understanding of, of sexual assault on campus. 
Um, in an era of evidence-based prosecution, college reports of sexual uh, violence are damning data points for US institutions of higher learning. The complex agency of abused women, coupled with the patriarchal rape customs of the university space, establishes the school campus as a necropolitical technology. Far from being evidence of the discipline that manages the bare life of the college students, so colleges um, produce all sorts of statistics about the population, they uh, have food and, and uh, other forms of statistical production there, um, the normal incidents, the normal incidents of sexual violence establishes the college campus as a site and management of social death. And here's uh, an attempt on my part to, to bring together the work of Orlando Patterson on the question of social death and Sheila Mbembe's work on, on the camp, the necropolitics of the camp as a technology. The consequence of rape in college, whether one prosecutes the crime or not, is not solely psychical um, and fit psychological trauma or physical and psychological trauma, distress caused by violence is correlated to poor school performance, which may compromise financial scholarships and a student's ability to remain in school. More important, the decision to report immediately jeopardizes existing peer relationships and horizons uh, for social interaction, as victims from, with complex agency right, experiencing that trauma can experience intense, intense desire to both avoid and further interact with their abuser and his or her friends and associates. Um, so here, part of what I'm talking about in this paper is that technologies, um, so the whole literature of tel telecare is really technophilic, and what I think we need are more theories of telecare from the perspective of those whose barren social lives are monitored and managed electronically by mass uh, state and corporate institutions. Okay, well, actually. Um, Currently, Title IX complaint uh, to end rape on campus, I'm sure you can find it these websites here, is making its way through the uh, US, court, US courts. The EROC complaint is comprised by um, interpenetrating media forms. EROC exists as a, a legal complaint, a document under file in the court docket, a website, and blogs um, informing students of the anti-discrimination complaint um, and how they can donate time. So this is about equal access to education in the aftermath of assault. In this context, the female trauma survivor has become a significant figure in forming the design protocols of sexual assault reporting technologies. The complex agency that characterizes uh, survivors of sexual and gender assault is a well-known debate in US criminal jurisp jurisprudence. Um, complex agency um, is, is, comes out of the work of sociologist Carrie Baker, who affirms the contradictory temporal and contingent nature of battered women's behavior. The time, space, and place of sexual assault reporting is undisciplined, unknown. Um, let's skip over here. Um, telecare uh, in college serves a unique uh, serves the unique needs of university campus hybrid domestic space and the complex nature of traumatic response. Historically, many ca college campuses in the U.S. offer student-run rape hotlines um, through some form of campus health service. Thus, the rape hotline um, is part of a feminist media history, a sonic scene for the emergence of vocal lament and complaint. And the following devices expand this feminist media history. Callisto, invented by a college student uh, formerly, uh, Jessica Ladd, Harass Map, and Fight Back are three mobile technologies uh, designed to assist victims of gender and sexual assault and, and violence. They are third-party sexual assault reporting technologies designed by nonprofit activists and for-profit entities alike and are currently marketed to universities and private individuals. What is distinctive about such, such electronic reporting databases um, and how they model is how they model or enact something called information escrow, a process allowing one to store a time-stamped encrypted assault report to be released in the event um, in a, a, a pre-chosen number of corroborating reports um, when, they're, when they're logged um, by other victims. At an institutional level, um, information escrow is a legal process that allows subscribers to collect and study sexual harassment and violence on campus. Significant to my study is the temporal intervention Callisto, Harass, Map, and Fight Back offer members through um, information um, escrow where hesitant and fearful victims have prolonged opportunities to initiate sexual assault claims. So what this kind of, um, what these apps do is they move the conversation from he said, she said to he said, they said, right? Um, information escrows allow people to transmit sensitive information to a trusted intermediary, an escrow agent, um, who only forwards the information under pre-specified conditions. For example, an allegation escrow for sexual harassment might allow a victim to take a, um, to place a private complaint into escrow with instructions that the complaint be lodged with proper authorities only if the escrow agent receives at least one additional allegation against the same individual. 
There are many kinds of information escrows, allegation, whistleblowing, suspicion escrow models, and so on. Um, a distinctive feature of sexual assault allegation escrows is that narratives of trauma inform the database structure. This is partly because victim activists and allies, who are typically women, have pioneered design initiatives. Right? Um, and so what I'm interested in here is, is, the, is, a, is actually a form of ga gamification that, is it, that, it, that becomes at play in these technologies. Assault allegation escrows thus reflect the gamification of social life. They play on an ethos of immediacy and tele that telecare devices circulate. Gamification is designed and, deploy and deployed in the key of neoliberal government feminism that resonates with derivative financial uh, transactions or cult cultures of finance. Telecare is thus not simply concerned with um, colonizing domestic space, but also um, to making alternate forms of time, carving time out of time through the phenomenon of social media following behavior. Um, so I, I can talk a little bit more about that, but I actually want to move on to the next case. Um, and that has to do with the case of um, community, uh, community bail fund nullification. Um, In the practice of community bail fund um, nullification, community members collectively post bail to strangers who are exposed to jail time. Bail money is the amount of a defendant's personal money a judge determines necessary to release said defendant back into the community until subsequent court appearances. Poor defendants, for poor defendants unable to pay these uh, fees, here, um, these hearings effectively become trials where defendants submit guilty pleas that expose them to long pretrial uh, jail detention in an effort to, um, to avoid monetary extraction from the courts. Where the victim of sexual assault is encouraged to game the timing of her accusations, the criminal defendant is reduced to gaming the body, financially coerced into submitting their bodies to jail time to avoid paying expensive bail. This then um, is a situation of risk society that community bail funds disrupt. In the context of the society of risk, consumers of telemedical services have something in common with indigent criminal defendants, those not yet in jail but under threat of imprisonment while uh, awaiting in, uh, arraignment. Like chronic medical patients, the criminal defendant is exposed to the risk of incarceration. Um, community jail funds are, import, are an important example of telecare because they are, often happen through um, mobile devices that should be included in this literature. They are an indigent crowdsourcing activity that brings together a form of collective dissent while recalling the media history of the telephone as an instrument of sentimental and familial attachment emerging in the 19th century. Telephones are, and the sentimental care practices they deliver are significant communication forms that mediate um, parenting while incarcerated. The telephone and the care enunciated across its cables takes on an extra burden for the children and lovers um, of geographically marginalized, such as the incarcerated. A number of researchers in the fields of public health, community psychology, and sociology examine the telecare networks of incarcerated parents and their children. Talking on the telephone to an imprisoned parents decreases child morbidity, stabilizes participation in school, while also um, ensuring um, that reuniting when, when possible with an imprisoned parent is less traumatic for children and parents. Significant numbers of poor children conduct relationships with parents almost exclusively by telephone. And this is in particular um, not just a poor issue, but, uh, but, but an issue that, that, that is included in, in blackness itself in the way of many times black folks who are separated from, from their children, from their families, communicate. Like that is, that is the line. Um, although indigent defendants often choose bail, um, at pretrial over paying crippling bail fees. Once incarcerated, they are then subject to crippling telephone service charges and recorded conversations, or further geographical marginalization. The prison phone extends telecare into the home as much as any medical device that monitors the vital signs of the patient. Like the university space, the jail telephone further hybridizes domestic space for those um, with an incarcerated family member. Um, and I'll actually stop there. I think we've got enough material to talk about during question and answer. But my real question about um, these two groups by trying to collide them together is to think about the ways in which uh, the telephone um, and, and uh, mobile apps, um, the, the, 
I'm wondering what kind of we is the they, basically? What kind of we gets established through the use of these kinds of um, sexual assault reporting devices? And what might happen when we collide that with the kind of we that gets established through the community bail fund, those people who help uh, <laughs> citizens raise money um, for their bail and the way that it challenges um, the judge's understanding of community safety and who exactly needs to be um, a part of the community, who can return home or not. Um, thank you. And Joy T. Puri. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for your help. And uh, thank you to Vanessa for shepherding us. And I decided I was going to break with convention and not thank Kimberly uh, for this wonderful space and for including me in it. So no thanks given. And, um, and I'm particularly not going to thank her for all of that invisible labor right. that goes into uh, creep. creating the space, sustaining it, and organizing events like these. So, um, this is somewhat of a departure from uh, my previous work um, that Vanessa so kindly introduced. And uh, this is, in fact, the very first time I'm actually publicly presenting some of this work. I uh, find myself very fortunate to do it in this space, and I would particularly welcome your feedback as a result of that. So. I have been haunted by this photograph for many years. It lingered with me, presenting itself at unexpected moments, even though I lost track of it during migrations to new laptops. <laughs> but it was really the image text that left the impact. Curated by Tejinder Singh Sibia, this photograph was annotated 1907 funeral for the first Sikh who died in Vancouver in 1907. No permission was granted by the mayor or others. They took the deceased to a distant forest in the middle of the night and cremated the body in the morning. My response was visceral. My stomach tightened as I looked at the photo, imagining what it must have been like for the early South Asian migrants to confront death in a foreign land to perform the death rites furtively in the wilderness, to be denied even the grace of one's cultural religious beliefs, to be forced to somehow transport the body in the middle of the night and cremate it in the morning on a makeshift pyre, all because, of the, mayor, all because the mayor and other officials didn't see it fit to permit a cremation within the town limits. While the rest of the image got fuzzy, what stayed with me over the years is the South Asian man in the foreground standing amidst the forest debris, perhaps because a subsequent search led me to this sliver from the larger image. In fact, um, as you'll see, there are two images, and they were basically split up into five. So it looked like there were five, but in fact, they were, they were uh, taken, drawn out of two. He's the one I most clearly remembered, hands in his pockets, looking down pensively at the scene. He is the one who stirred questions about what it is like to face death out of time, but also death out of place. Would I, too, die here without reconciling with this place, a place where I'm yet to feel at home some 30 years later? The estrangement of death confronted us both. My first encounter with death was also through text images. Indian comic books called Amar Chitra Katha, or Immortal Picture Stories. Begun in 1967 by Anand Pai, these illustrated stories were meant to restore us children of colonialism to a landscape of mythological stories and historical events, which is what led me to the god of death, Lord Yama. This particular story is about Savitri, whose devotion, resolve, and wit won back her husband's life from Lord Yama. Savitri marries Satyavan, despite knowing that he would die a year later. But when Lord Yama comes to take Satyavan's soul, she follows them through the forest and into the mountains. In this space where life and death are suspended, 
Savitri outwits the god of death who congenially admits his defeat and restores Satyavan's life. Like most recuperative projects, these comic books were hardly innocent of the pitfalls of religion, caste, gender, sexuality, and the racialized politics of colorism. You can sort of see that. And Savitri's name has gone from being synonymous with ideal Indian womanhood to pure irony. At the same time, it was an illustration of the impermanence of not only life, but also death, and of death's fluid time spaces. At a moment when anti-immigrant discourses are rife in the US and elsewhere, what do the lives, or more precisely, the deaths of South Asian immigrants to North America have to teach us? Death, perhaps more than life, reveals the cultural rituals that provide a blueprint for funerary practices and mourning. But what happens when these cultural practices are out of sync with state and social provisions for the disposal of bodies and grieving? Or when these practices have to be navigated, reinvented, or fought for by immigrant communities? Studying death among South Asian migrants reveals the fault lines of race, religion, and nation under conditions of settler colonialism and colonial rule, the aftermath of slavery, empires, diasporas, white supremacy, and nativism. Its visual archive unearths tensions between prohibition and spectacle, the fear of and fascination with fire, an evidentiary and imaginary photography in ways that speaks to the histories of Native American funerary practices, but also lynching and the exclusion of immigrants of color at the turn of the 20th century. It encourages the need to rethink death as cessation of time toward grappling with questions of impermanence and death's enduring relationship to land and space. As profound as first impressions are, they are also partial. Sight is dependent on perception and memory is in incomplete at best. Seeing the first image with fresh eyes, I registered the more than 20 mostly sick, but also possibly Hindu or Muslim men, and the cluster of white men and boys on the right. I don't know if you can see them, but they're just on the right side of the image. Perhaps I just didn't see past the South Asian men in the photo, but now I attend closely to the details. The casket neatly draped in dark cloth, placed on a bed of logs, the hunched shoulders and folded hands of the men encircling the casket, one just off center among his kinsmen, his body slightly turned away, perhaps distracted by the camera, the stances of the white onlookers, and the camera's unfettered access. There is also a second image taken later, centering the funeral pyre, showing the flames at the bottom and billowing smoke blurred from the slow click of the camera. As time shifts, so does the perception of space. The angle of the camera closes in on the burning pyre. The light is different, and fewer South Asian men remain while white bystanders have taken their places. Neither temporality nor spatiality of the scene appears fixed. The first of the two photos is located in Vancouver, whereas the other is placed in Todd Inlet, and I'm going by the annotations at the Vancouver Public Library, which is around 100 kilometers out of, outside of the city, known as, known as Sneet Kuth by the Saanich First Nation, it was the site of a cement plant which employed Chinese and Sikh migrants, exposing them to high rates of tuberculosis and silicosis, as Manmohan Singh work note, with notes, due to death, I'm sorry, due to dust from cement and the coal bags that were required to carry, res sorry, I'm gonna start this again. Um, so this was about exposing the sick and uh, Chinese migrants to high rates of tuberculosis and silicosis, as Manmohan Singh work notes, due to dust from cement and the coal bags that they were required to carry, resulting in the death of Targul Singh, who is being cremated in the photos. 
Targul Singh and other South Asians were part of the British imperial circuit, whereby subjects dislocated from one colonial outpost sought recourse in another, becoming economic and political migrants and refugees. Although the dubious virtue of being subjects of the British crown should have allowed them entry into Canada, they were frequently prohibited due to nativist and white supremacist policies, which were earlier honed during efforts to exclude Chinese immigrants. By 1906, there were an estimated 1,500 South Asians around the Vancouver region, and their lives were made difficult by unrelenting racism. The racism culminated a few months later in the Bellingham riot that then reverberated around Vancouver and beyond, leading to the expulsion of the South Asian migrants. This may have well been the first time that the South Asian men and their deceased kinsmen figured into photographs, but the historical mix of colonialism and photography had previously rendered them subjects. Photography arrived in India within months of its development in Europe and gained more traction after the watershed 1857 uprising. In this context, as in other colonial outposts, photography functioned as a colonial arm serving its racialized anthropological and forensic needs. In North America, photography and other visual technologies played a particularly decisive role in producing subjectivities aligned with the imperatives of settler colonialism and slavery. Such technologies were crucial to generating what Robert Burkhofer Jr. called, and I quote, the white man's Indian. And by the turn of the 20th century, were being actively used across Canada and the US to document the arguably vanishing Indian. Illustrated in compilations such as Edward Curtis's The North American Indian, published between 1907 and 1930, Daniel Francis notes that these images were carefully staged with subjects, props, and corrected to remove evidence of white culture. While six were featured in Indian colonial archives primarily as soldiers and warriors in a way that Bakirati was also referring to, photographers in the North American context recorded them in their capacities as migrant labor. Images of sick men in the Pacific Northwest arriving into ports, working on railroad construction and such are present alongside the cremation photo in the archive that was first assembled by Sibia. Alongside the anthropological renderings of six are also examples of visuals that resonate with what Kimberly Juanita Brown, Jasmine Cobb, and other scholars have argued, that photography did not only have a defining influence on how slavery was known and understood, but it also reimagined and reconstructed representations of black subjectivity before and after the end of slavery. Examples in Sibia's archive include mostly sick men dressed in their finery, including their military uniforms and colonial insignias earned as soldiers, but also sharp European suits that are in the idiom of the family photograph. Indeed, migrant communities have left records of the ephemerality of death and the iterative practices of homemaking. Dating from the late 19th into the early 20th century, many such images exist of funeral gatherings and processions among Japanese migrants in Hawaii. These panoramic photos were part of customs that were previously established in Japan, freezing the moments when the death are still part of the living. Such images present a genealogical portrait that binds together not just the histories of those who are gone with those who remain, but also what is especially important to the story of migration. Here we are. We are here. Surely then, the archive is not just about the colonial gaze, but also what Courtney Baker has usefully described as the variegated practice of looking. But these complexities are mostly lost in the intrusive photos of the cremation. Consider here another image attributed to Bourne and Shepherd, the first photo studio in Asia established in 1860s. 
In an image circa 1870s of a body being prepared for cremation, all is revealed to the viewer for a probing visual examination. Her prostate body on a pile of logs in a shallow pit, her tonsured hair, her head, her uncovered torso, the priest performing the last rites, the four women squatting around the body and a young man with a vessel in hand. The up close view arouses, titillates, satisfies, and perhaps even horrifies the distant viewer, blurring the lines between pornography and posthumous photography. This, even as one of the squatting women, her head covered, arms on her knees and hands interlocked, returns the camera's unrelenting gape, reminding us that some encroachments do not diminish with time. On closer inspection, the first cremation image turns out to be a yellowing postcard. At the same time, it was not unusual for photos to be developed into picture cards, which in this case is 19 centimeters by 14 centimeters. <clears throat> Although this is different from the format of the postcard, which popularizes the photo as commodity in an age of mass visual reproduction, they are not unrelated. Reading lynching picture cards along with other visual formats such as stereographs, Jacqueline Goldsby emphasizes, emphasizes the aesthetics of visual technology that shaped how lynching was depicted and seen by a national viewership. Even though picture cards by the late 19th century were widely popular in the US, being easily handled, collected, and exchanged, the power of lynching picture cards she compellingly compellingly argues, lay in their scarcity, unpredictability, and irregularity. I'll just finish one um, paragraph and stop there. Cremation images at the end of the century were hardly being mass produced. Although here is another cremation. This one is entitled um, Hindu, but is most likely Sikh, in Arrowhead in British Columbia in postcard format. But as the annotations on the cremation images that I began with indicate, the first image has a copy negative which suggests that if the original negative were to be lost, it would be still possible to produce more pictures. The negative for the second cremation image um, appears to have survived, and what also exists is a relatively large copy print. Thus, these and other photos of cremations in North America lie in the North American West lies somewhere between mass production and the scarcity of lynching picture cards. And their purpose lies somewhere between generating pic pretty pictures and satisfying the desires for spectacles. So where I go from here is to think through the tensions between prohibitions and restrictions around immigrant cremations and making of visual spectacles. This at the same moment when white elites are turning to cremation as a modern alternative to burial, while distancing themselves from the suppression of crematory practices among some Native American communities. I dwell on the role of fire in the white Christian imagination, ranging from the destruction of cities, forests, its sonic qualities, but also its symbolic and material use to destroy, the burning of witches, the use of fire to lynch, or where lynchings ended with the burning of the body, as well as its association with the burning of widows in South Asia. The work continues, and I welcome your feedback. OK. OK, we have time for questions. Um, I'd just like to have you all keep in mind the feedback that the panelists were looking for. Uh, thank you all for the presentations. I was thinking um, about, Kelly Moore, your question about the applications. And part of what I haven't completely formed the, the response, but I was thinking about how we understand violation in body and whether or not that's an individual understanding or one that happens in conversation. And I'm thinking about that the people who are likely to put something in an app alone it's very different from the people who are, I mean, I, I know that I know, I know that I've come to awareness about things that have happened with my body in conversation with other women in a way that an app doesn't, 
that wouldn't be represented in an application. And I also just thought about the, I mean, you didn't mention it, but I know that the Mother's Day bailout is coming up again, and I don't know if that was the kind of thing we were thinking about, but um, how that, for me, is connected to political community. And, but, the, but so I see those two apps as ta tapping into different kinds of communities. I see the, the one as being a much more individualistic understanding of body and, and not being created in conversation. But for me, like the Mother's Day bailout thing is completely a, this is my political community conversation. Mm. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I, I agree. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm interested in bringing these two groups together um, is precisely that tension where for so-called women's matters or women's issues, particularly as a, a white body is typically um, the model for that kind of um, plea or complaint of, that seeks redress for sexual violation. Um, there is a way in which the app, I think, imagines an individual approach um, that when you think then about something like the community bailout, um, even in its name, right? Um, even as you bring up the, the Mother's Day um, uh, bail, bailout that's, that's also approaching, um, it's a very different model. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in bringing precisely those kinds of approaches together, those ways of um, grieving, lamenting the role of technology um, and sort of what, again, what kind of we is, is imagined in both of those forms of assembly. Um, and, and thinking more about um, how when you apply questions about race and gender um, to that kind of lament or, 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 or grieving, um, you get very interesting, um, you get very different political histories um, that um, enact forms of redress, right? So I thank you for that, that's exactly what I'm up to. Yeah, and different kinds of redress. That's exactly what, what I'm up to, so mm. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Given that you asked us to think about this, I, I definitely have been trying to connect um, those two instances, those two communities, and I couldn't help but um, think about the, um, who is implicated in uh, the application? Like, um, it seems as if um, the redress would be connected to the prison industrial complex in a way that um, the bailout is also like, the other side of that. Um, so I feel like there's a connection there yeah. from victim and perpetrator in which the prison industrial complex is, is called up. I also think class is one of those places that uh, there's a connection between race and gender and class. And so who has access to a smartphone or who can understand their body as one that's worth protecting that would then be able to use an application to understand what happened to them as something like sexual harassment, even if it isn't sexual violence, like something that is sexual harassment is often hard to note. Yeah. And then um, just like the expansion of the police state that is the, on the other side of that app is something that I kept thinking about. And all the images um, were of, I think, people who are gendered as men in the imagery. And so the kind of gendered relationship between those, those two different groups of people. And, and then my, other, my question is around uh, bare life and social death uh, and necropolitics. Like how are those connected in each I wasn't clear about how, how you were thinking about those in each of those instances. Yeah. Yeah, thanks again. Um, I, I really, some of this work has really led me to think about the university as a space and the kinds of claims that get made around rape, which is again a normal, regular, routine practice. Um, it's A, to make that point, right? That the campus, that the university, the neoliberal university is a, a camp space in which those kinds of death politics are enacted. Um, death, yes, I mean, especially if we consider fraternity culture and the, you know, the kinds of deaths that happen under hazing rituals or things like that. But the kind of social death that happens for the student afterward 
in their ability to get education and being ostracized. So those are the ways I'm trying to bring those concepts together. Um, but I'm also trying to bring this work um, to light in a moment where we realize, yes, there's again this connection between the university space and the prison industrial complex, but also around um, the pleasure that we take around um, women programmers, because the programmers of these technologies, these these apps are women, right? And we think about Black Girls Code. That's mm -hmm. wonderful news. You know, no one's upset about Black Girls Code, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I'm trying to bring together, you know the kind of underside of, of neoliberal working in the, in the university space um, as a source of a, of a variety of opportunities for women programmers around rape, but then again, sort of throw that into relief with prison industrial, you know, with, with what's happening with bail, which still seems, you know, rather archaic and, and people don't think that um, the kind of activism that's going on there is nearly as innovative, for example, as something like the programming that goes into making these apps. So I, I really wanna see those kinds of online and offline and in between forms of activism and, and really bring them together um, in a way that's theoretically productive, but if it's, but I'm concerned. I have some concern about my own reasons to bring it together. Um, I have two questions, one for Tara, one for Gyoti, and, um, and it kind of flips us back to the uh, previous panel, because I'm actually really curious about the haptic dimensions of both of your archives. Um, so the haptic dimensions of um, the listing and double bookkeeping, and a double bookkeeping that is not simply about transactions. Right, so what inspires somebody to archive themselves in this deeply colonial modality, right? And, and it's just really, really remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even within that, what you were talking about, about the sort of the haptic, the haptic dimensions of his penmanship, um, which is again, another like deeply colonized, <laughs> you know, um, uh, modality. And so I was hoping you could say something about that. And Yoti, your, your, um, your archive, I wonder who kept and circulated those images, right? For whom were they so precious that they um, made the trip forward in time into these particular archives? And, and was it a community? Thing, right? It, was it was it handed down through a community? Um, yeah, because it's just you know, its survival itself is such a gorgeous you know testament to somebody's love of this particular or their investment in this particular ritual. So that's what I really like about Caesar Linden is that he he seems very much a part of. The colonial enterprise. Um, he, he he is complicit, you know, and at, at least at least what I can tell about him presently. I mean, and there's still a lot more work that I need to do to think about Caesar Linden and his account book. But all in all, you know, I think that his decision to archive or to remember or to make note of of his interactions is very much connected to the business that he is helping to run. And I think that what, what has me return to him again and again at this point is, is wrestling with the fact that he's, as I suggested, so complicit. His handwriting is beautiful. It's supposed to be beautiful because he's the one who has to copy everything down. <laughs> you know, his, 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 um, his master is also a clerk for the Rhode Island General Assembly. So I think that there's an interesting genealogy of clerks who are, who are ultimately writing things down to be preserved, to be remembered, to be archived. And you know, I think that while Josias Linden may seem like the obvious, um, the, the obvious a remnant, instead it's Caesar Linden who is so well cataloged. Um, it's Caesar Linden who who is making note of 
of so many interactions. And I think that the account book that's at the Rhode Island Historical Society is only one half of his account book. There's also a ledger that's even, even cuter than the one that is actually there. The handwriting is even better. Um, so I don't necessarily have the why as an answer, but certainly that observation is what has me so inclined to talk about Caesar Linden all the time, which is currently what I do. Tina, thank you so much. Is this on? OK, sorry, I couldn't hear it. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, so my, the way I understand it, or what I've been able to um, piece together so far, is that the Jinder Singh, Singh Sibia uh, was a librarian in the UC system. And he's the one who really created that first archive. Um, that was available online for quite a bit, which is how a friend of mine saw that photograph and then shared it with me many, many years ago. And then because of some sort of concerns, be because there were these photographs were sourced from multiple families, um, there was some concern. And so they took that off and, and now are in the process of kind of recataloging and reestablishing that website. Mm -hmm. But so I think as you were already hinting, it was, it was sort of passed down in certain families, um, but also through Sikh temples. And Sikh temples historically have been really important repositories of history. And they have been, you know, that's sort of been one of the mechanisms through which some of these records have survived, and not only photographs, but also letters and other things that have been digitized over a period of time. So in that sense, I think what was in some ways embedded in your question that it is this kind of collective um, shared history, which makes it, I think, all that more poignant. Um, Thank you for your presentations. My question, I have two questions for Tara. Um, so the first concerns um, Caesar Linden's broader context. I mean, he's in Rhode Island. Right, which is the epicenter of slave trading in the Western Hemisphere. So yes. I'm wondering how much of <laughs> that should be said all the time. Right. <laughs> so I'm wondering how much you think this like mode of recording arises out of that very particular culture, right? And then second, in terms of um, thinking about African American literature, what it is and what it is not. I wonder how productive it might be for you to think about uh, Lyndon in relationship to someone like Venture Smith. And I know that you know Smith didn't write his own narrative, he recounted it. But in terms of like the deep fiscal and effective accounting that goes on in Venture Smith, where he's constantly talking about um, the, this history um, of being you know, plundered out of uh, money, plundered, plundered out of acreage, and he keeps great detail, right? I, I lost this amount of dollars. Um, they stole this amount of land from me. And even when his children die, very often it's, if my child hadn't have died, you know, and, and I already paid half of their manumission, mm -hmm. but I've lost it. So I'm wondering if there's some type of um, way to think of, and, and he was also um, enslaved in New England and had some overlap in, in Rhode Island, I believe, in, in some instances. So I'm wondering if Smith might be an interesting, like, sort of interlocutor to think about in relationship to Lyndon, um, writing at the end of the 18th century. Um, yeah. So I always think about Rhode Island and its, its slavery problem or it's money um it's, it's it's slavery money i was at brown yesterday and i was like oh my god all this slavery money um so i think that it's certainly not lost on me that caesar linden's account book is one of what had to have been many in and around newport and i know to return to brown john carter brown library has a ton of account books so one of the things that i want to do is to look at other account books that are contemporaneous with Caesar Linden and also see how they talk to one another because I imagine that they are talking to the same set of names depending on where folks are. So, you know, if I had to think about like the the biggest names that I've come across, you know, they are they are folks that still have money today, of course. Um, their names are still on buildings in Rhode Island. So yeah, streets, all of that. Um, so so that is one, one thing that I've not done yet, but I definitely have a mind to that. And before Caesar Linden, I didn't think very much about 
money or representations of money um, in early African American literature, just because that wasn't my interest. But I think in addition to Venture Smith, um, Phyllis Wheatley also keeps accounts as well of her transactions with her books. Um, and I, I, and the um, Free African Union Society also does. The African Female Society of Newport also does. So once I started looking for people actually tracking dollars and cents um, who are black, I get, it's relatively commonplace, even though admittedly Phyllis Wheatley isn't keeping something that is an actual account book. The Free African Union Society is not keeping an, at least I don't know of, an actual account book. Um, so I think that part of what I would love to, to you know, kind of press upon um, scholars of early America or early African American literature more specifically is to pay attention to the way that the actual accounts are kept and to attend to that language. Because I, I haven't heard many folks talk about the fact that Phyllis Wheatley is selling her books by way of a black woman in Newport, Rhode Island, right? Isn't that surprising? Yeah, you know, so <laughs> Uber Tanner is selling Wheatley's books and, and Phyllis Wheatley is like, oh, thanks for the money. Here's 300 more books. Like 300 books you're selling in Newport, Rhode Island? Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all of that. Thank you. We have dinner this evening where lots more conversation can be had around this. And this ends today's panels. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly. Oh, yeah. Oh, and one more minute? Oh, one more talk. No, I know. That's why I meant panels are done. Yes, we do. We do have more. Sorry. Because I was letting you know that I would be done. <laughs> Thank you. <for> <laughs> Great job! Oh, yeah. <laughs>